March 16, 2018. T-Rex is extinct in international affairs. The House Intel Committee claimed no collusion, then walked it back. Stormy Daniels wants to return to payoffs. She can dish to Anderson Cooper. And our president is planning to fight the Galactic Empire with a proposed space force. Hang on to your diapies, babies. It's Barbara, and this is the Beta Files. Welcome to round two. A little experiment on this week's show. We'll dive into the wonderful world of your prototypical beautiful wall, discuss the pros and cons of a Death Star, and try to break down the enigma that is the House Intelligence Committee. Does it live up to its name? Dr. J will stop by and discuss William Faulkner, and I want to discuss the value of social media in our current culture. Is Facebook good, evil, or the first step to singularity? Before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to all those rule-breaking kids that walked out on Tuesday. For the adults whose attention you didn't already have, you have it now. March 24th should be a more impressive statement just based on what I've seen so far. The coolest moment of the protest that I've personally noted was that of a California high school where the students participated in a die-in, spelling the word enough across their football field while a gong was banged 17 times to honor the 17 victims from last month. Another notable from Tuesday was a young second grader from San Jose named Leonardo Aguilar who, being the only student from his elementary school to walk out, joined the high school students across the way to show his support. In the photo I viewed of the young protester he was wearing a sign that simply said, Guns are cruel, not cool. Kudos to Leonardo and all the young men and women who took a step forward this past Tuesday. Keep fighting. Your voices are gaining volume. And now it's the headlines. Monday saw a flurry of heavy activity from Washington as our favorite storm of a porn star announced that she would gladly return all $130,000 she received in order to let it all hang out, including photos and possible videos. <coughs> I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. This is in anticipation of the 60 Minutes interview with America's favorite gay snowman, Anderson Cooper, where it can be assumed that she will dish all about her former lover, possible client. By Wednesday, New Revelation shared that there was a second lawyer involved with the payoff, adding more intrigue into the story that would normally end a presidency. But of course, nothing about this current administration is normal. The House Intelligence Committee rushed out a report on Monday that noted they could not find sufficient evidence that there was collusion between Trump and the Russians. Democrats immediately came out fighting, noting that they did not support the report and pointed to the many flaws that the report has, along with the implications that cannot be substantiated as evidence was not officially gathered. That did not stop Trump and state media Fox News from declaring victory as if the other investigations still in play don't exist. Trump's immediate treat on the matter was written in all caps, the point that Fox News had to explain their AARP audience, basically the entire audience, that the all caps meant that he was yelling, which correspondent, Fox News Barbie number three, then read in a loud voice for effect. It was ineffective. By Tuesday evening, however, the New York Times was running a story noting how several of the committee's Republicans were already backstepping to make sure the public understood that only that committee could not find enough evidence, to which Adam Schiff, the leading Democrat on the committee, noted, no shit, Sherlock. He pointed to the very few witnesses the committee called and the brazen reluctance by Nunez and his cadre to follow up their questions with those few who came before the committee, leading many to wonder just what is the combined IQ of the Republican members of the Intelligence Committee. I'm betting it's a small fraction of the Koch brothers' paycheck. The biggest news of the week came crashing down like an earth-killing ass on Tuesday as Secretary of State Rex Tillerson got the Trump dump through, not surprisingly, a tweet. Rumors abound that Chief Staff Kelly warned Rex, and whether that's true or not, we'll never know. What we do know is that in the immediate post-tweet moments, Undersecretary Steve Goldstein came out with a story that didn't mesh with the White House byline and received his own pink slip, probably through text. Heather Newert of Fox & Friends fame will replace him, and of course she will. She's blonde, she's young, and she's from Fox & Friends. The Math isn't hard to do, folks. CIA Director Mike Pompeo will replace Rex, and Mistress of the Dark Gina Haspel has been nominated to replace Pompeo as the first female CIA director. However, several in the Senate questioned the pick over her ties to torture and questionable actions in the past. John McCain and Rand Paul have both been vocal about her pick and plan to vet her thoroughly through the hearings. 
There's another shocker in the over office trapdoor lottery when Trump's personal aide was fired for shifty financial matters that kept him from obtaining permanent security clearance. One of the lighter moments of the announcement came when Casey Hunt of MSNBC quickly noted that it had nothing to do with any of the financial investigations into Trump or the Trump campaign, meaning that Paul Manafort is not the only person tied to Trump who did shady business deals outside of a Trump property. Hang tight, we're not done with Tuesday yet. Trump flew out to California to view prototypes with his big, beautiful wall, feeding the press corps taco bowls on the flight out, insulting the governor as soon as he landed, and telling a group from the Marine Corps, spell C-O-R-E per POTUS, that he was contemplating the creation of a space force, like an air force, but in space. Because we all know that those pesky Klingons and the Romulans have been interfering with our weather satellites and direct TV signal. For those of you either scratching your head or laughing or both, yes, this is true. He actually said he wants to create a space force to fight in space. What we will fight is anyone's guess, but that petition for a Death Star a few years ago may actually get traction again. Late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning brought news of a Pennsylvania coup by the Democrats as Rick Saccone, porn stash and all, lost his bid to Connor Lamb to represent a district that will no longer be a district once lines are redrawn to fix the blatantly gerrymandered map drawn by state Republicans. The biggest story from the upset? That a Democrat beat a Republican in a district that is undeniably gerrymandered for the Republican Party. Trump's bump turned out to be more of a bump down for Saccone as pundits are largely pointing to the possible rejection nationwide of the Republican Party come November. It is the latest in a string of victories by the Democratic Party, but it all leads to the question of how badly the Dems are going to screw this up come November. Just like the Republican Party that seems to be shrugging their shoulders over which way to go in the current environment, the Democrats are just as confused and befuddled as to which way to point their ship. Identity politics are on the slide down, while econ- economic and social welfare is on the slide up. Healthcare is still hanging out there, and with the Me Too movement, Parkland High Schoolers, and the tax cut fiasco, the Democrats are still at a no-lose situation. But if history teaches us anything, unless there's another Barack Obama waiting to land in their laps, this party will blunder the opportunity, making November look more and more interesting. Wednesday kept the news crawl going at warp speed when late in the afternoon the FBI Disciplinary Office announced that based on recommendations by the Department of Justice and the Inspector General, Andrew McCabe, the former deputy head of the FBI and interim director following the firing of James Comey, violated policy and authorized disclosure of sensitive materials to reporters, then lied about it to investigators. McCabe allowed two high-ranking officials from the FBI to sit down with the Wall Street Journal and disclose information pertaining to an investigation into his Hillary Clinton's family foundation before the investigation was complete. Violating FBI rules that state information regarding a current investigation cannot be given out until the investigation is considered complete. The news breaks just days before McCabe is set to retire, which means that they pull the trigger before March 18th, McCabe will lose all of his retirement benefits, something several reporters have noted would be seen as a vindictive shot by the current administration as our commander-in-chief has done little to hide his disdain for McCabe. It doesn't take much to figure out why Trump can't stand McCabe, but I'll give you a hint anyway. It rhymes with Hillary Benton. If they don't pull the trigger, pundits point out that it would look like Sessions is playing against Trump by not heeding to the president's longtime wishes of removing McCabe permanently. Either way, the story has presented an interesting catch-22 for all involved. The Senate passed legislation that rolled back a lot of the regulations tied to Dodd-Frank on Wednesday, clearing the way for, as they sold it, smaller banks to be able to more easily maneuver in the marketplace, but garnering opposition that noted the actions taken by the legislation could lead to another massive financial crisis like the 2008 crash that led to the regulations in the first place. Time will tell. Larry Kudlow was named as Trump's new economic advisor. The CNBC analyst has been hammered in numerous op-eds as being not only unfit for the job, but possibly the worst economist without a degree in economics Trump could have chosen. The Washington Post went so far as to call him out in a piece titled, Larry Kudlow may have been more wrong about the economy than anyone alive. They pointed out that back in December 2008, he was the sole commentator screaming that there was no bubble burst and promoting a Bush economy that was on the way up, as he put it, while the stock market crashed all around him. So, hey, if you're going to have a tycoon who is the master of bankruptcy run the country, why not have an economic advisor who knows nothing about economic downturns as the economy crashes and burns with him in it? 
Sounds like a hell of a team to me. Finally, last weekend, Trump went campaigning for the aforementioned Rick Saccone when he mentioned Chuck Todd in one of his famous put-downs, calling Todd a sleeping son of a bitch in the middle of telling a story about his visit to Meet the Press in 1999 with Tim Russert. He noted, without any provocation, that the show was now hosted by sleepy-eyed Chuck Todd and then went on to note, he's a sleeping son of a bitch, I'll tell ya. In defense of one of my favorite TV personalities, I will simply note that maybe Chuck looks so sleepy because it has been so hard to keep up with this administration and all the mess on Capitol Hill piled up on top of it. I think if we are going to point out Chuck's exhausted look, we need to go back to the moment when this administration launched its attacks on his sleeping habits. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility of the entire White House press office no, it on doesn't. day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains alternative that facts. And there you have it. You be the judge. That's headlines for this week. Okay, it is time to welcome my dear friend and colleague, Dr. J, who is here to join me in a short discussion on an author we both enjoy, the master of the whiskey binge writing purge, commander of stream of conscious writing, and son of a mythical confederacy he loved to hate while lusting for its ugliness, Mr. William Faulkner. Dr. J, what's going on, man? Not a lot, man. What's going on? (laughs) Not much. All right, so... um, I wanted to start off with um, a passage from Absalom, Absalom, and I know you asked me to pull out Wolf Whistle, and we'll talk about Wolf Whistle in a minute. Um, But this is the uh, passage towards the end of the book where Shreve is questioning uh, Quentin, and it's, um, listen, I'm not trying to be funny. even if I could stay there. Wait, listen, I'm not trying to be funny, smart. I just want to understand it if I can. Don't know how to say it better because it's something my people haven't got. Or if we have got it, it all happened long ago across the water and so there ain't anything to look at every day to remind us of it. We don't live among defeated grandfathers and freed slaves. Or have I got it backward, and was it your folks that are free and the niggers that lost, and bullets in the dining room table and such, to be always reminding us to never forget? What is it? Something you live and breathe in like air? A kind of vacuum filled with wraith-like and indomitable anger and pride and glory at um, and in happenings that occurred and ceased 50 years ago? A kind of entailed birthright father and son and father and son of never forgiving General Sherman so that forevermore, as long as your children's children produce children... You won't be anything but a descendant of a long line of colonels killed in Pickett's charge at Manassas. Gettysburg, Quentin said. You can't understand it. You would have to be born there. Um... (laughs) <laughs> the crux of everything that's Faulkner. Period, right? That's it's yeah. It's one sentence. It's one sentence, yeah. It's one long sentence and Quentin says you it's Gettysburg. <laughs> Which is ironic because, you know, earlier in the book, uh Quentin is trying to explain um West Virginia to Shreve and Shreve corrects him and says, you know, West Virginia didn't exist before the Civil War and Quentin just kinda of brushes over it. You think it matters that, that Quentin's response is so terse? Because you can't talk about it. Shree's trying to talk about it. Clinton can't Shree, talk yeah. about it. You can't say anything. Yeah. Except you'd have to be born there. You have to be born there. Yeah, Period. I think... <laughs> well, I think... I I don't think he's being terse at Shreve, I think he's being terse because of what Shreve is pointing out. And I think this is... I think this is the moment where Quentin is starting to realize that it's all a hoax. You know? It's a sham. It's know? a sham, yeah. So what is it, what is it, uh, what is it Shree says? It's like Ben-Hur. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a drama. <laughs> yeah. It's just a drama. Well, and there's that, that other moment where he says, let me play for a while. You know? <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. Because right, he, he doesn't, he doesn't see this as being real. Exactly. It's a show for him. Exactly. So I think a pageant, I don't know if he uses that word in the novel or not. He doesn't. But it's the word that Faulkner uses to describe these books. Yeah. It's a pageant. He uses the word drama, I believe, but that's about it. Yeah. That's. But yeah. he do, He keeps alluding to different um, dramatic pieces. Sure. <laughs> and then, it, Yeah, and then and then ends up calling uh, Rosa Colefield a Guinevere. <laughs> 
Oh my God, I forgot about that entirely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I brought that up because you, uh, unlike me, I've never been to Oxford, but you actually got to spend time in Oxford. So uh, based on yeah. just... Um, Based on that little piece and looking at Quentin's attitude and towards you know what Shreve has said again, not towards Shreve but towards what he said, what do they like in Oxford? Are they more like Quentin or Shreve? Uh, well, I mean it's it's weird, right? I mean, uh, I was there for about eleven years. I'm you know I'm not from there. I'm I'm from up here. It, 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 it's thirteen hours away in a different state. On the East Coast, we consider it the South. Yeah. One of the things I learned when I was there is they don't consider it the South up here. They yeah. consider anyone who I think lives above South Carolina a Yankee. Mm-hmm. There's a, I think they have a geograph- geographical problem, but um, they're very proud of it. And I think I think they still, and I don't want to, to, to stereotype or generalize, but I think in Oxford and in, in much of the much of Mississippi. There's still that sense of living in the past. Mm. If you go to the square, and all the all the towns, or most of the towns in, in Mississippi have a square, and in the middle of the square is the courthouse, and around the courthouse you will still see these Confederate monuments that have been uh, bleached by time, mm-hmm. and they haven't changed them. I, I don't think they'll even even after all the other monuments are gone. I think yeah. they'll stay. But I think what Faulkner talks about is kind of the lost cause. Yeah and the tragic idea of the South. I think they've invented it. I think the South that they want to be or want to exist never existed. Right. And I think this is what Faulkner is talking about, and the great irony here, if it is irony, is they don't realize that they're trying to memorialize this while also memorializing Faulkner. These two things don't square. If you Mm -hmm. read Faulkner, Faulkner's attacking this idea. Yeah. And I don't think they see it. They hated Faulkner when he was alive. Mm-hmm. And now he's like a now he's like a saint. Well, <laughs> let's look at why they hated him because <laughs> he kind of oh, made fun crap. of them. You know, I mean, he um, everyone knows Jefferson is Oxford. Uh, right. er, everybody knows, you know, the dark humor. Especially if you look at something like As I Lay Dying, uh, the dark humor behind all that. He's making fun of of Oxford, Mississippi, and he's making fun of the people that live there and how I don't want to say. Well, I guess blissfully ignorant they could be. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know? They were provincial. They were provincial. Mm-hmm. Many of them never left Oxford. Yeah. Or Lafayette County. Never left. Um, well, I'm and not it, sure where I was going to go with that. <laughs> well, then, no, that's fine. Uh, no, looking at, um, well, look at uh, going back to As I Lay Dying, and this is right at the forefront of my mind because we just, I just went over this uh, in my lit class. Um, you know, Darl, the only way he can escape his family is through the insane asylum. <laughs> And then there's something to be said about that. What Faulkner is trying to say there, you know, the only way to get out is go crazy. So, yeah. You know? Yeah, and. Well, and you see this kind of weirdness there too. Uh, mm-hmm. I think I think the problem the problem with with Faulkner and, and you, the other excerpt you, you've got in front of you mm-hmm. kind of deals with this. It, if if you lived in Oxford while he was writing it, and if you even heard about the novels that he was writing, you would start to wonder, "Am I in this book?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because if you come from one of the older families, you're going to look like you're, you know, from this book or in this mm-hmm. book. And what he does with these old families is not very really flattering. Right. Because he shows how weird they are. And there are still pretty weird people in Oxford who've been living there for 150 years. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and before the war even. Yeah, the old aristocracy. Yeah. Yeah, and what the excerpt from the book, actually, the one you've got, the one you've got there, too, kind of yeah. deals with this. That, that it's not maybe as original as we think. Yeah. Well, all right, I'll go ahead and read that then, um, since you keep coming back to it. Um, <laughs> no, it's, no, it's cool. Uh, so basically what it is, they're talking, the they that you're going to hear is uh, reporters from the North, and they're covering um, a fictionalized version of Emmett Till's um, 
uh, uh, court case, the the guys that got brought up on Emmett Till. And uh, it starts off uh, talking about one of the main characters is female. Says she knew they were making fun of her. She just wasn't sure what the joke was all about. They looked at the trees in a small park in the center of town. They said, which one of these trees is a magnolia tree? They said, are there any alligators around here? Snapping turtles. These boys knew how to laugh. They asked colored men standing on a corner if they would sing a verse or two from Old Man River. They were serious. They said they'd be willing to pay $2 just to hear a verse or two of Old Man River by an authentic soul of the South. The colored men said they couldn't recollect ever having heard of the song. The reporters said, amazing. (laughs) They wrote dispatches for their newspapers and magazines. They wrote that the scenery itself was hostile. The scenery is as oppressive as the moss that hangs from the cypress trees, they wrote. The silence is like taut skin, they wrote, and the faint heart startles when that silence is cracked by the hiss of a suddenly opened coke. That's the way they wrote about Arrowcatcher, Mississippi. It was pure D poetic. They shook their heads in disbelief at everything they saw. They said Faulkner was only a reporter. They said Faulkner was only the camera's eye. They went up to men sitting on benches in front of Wooten's cobbler shop. They said, where is the nearest motel? The men on the benches considered the question. They leaned down between their legs and spit into a lard bucket and wiped off drippings of snuff from their chin. The men on the benches said, the nearest what? <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you have to go any further. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it coming back to Faulkner and uh, Shreve's argument. And um, by the way, I'm reading past. Uh, I'm reading from Norden's Wolf Whistle. If you have a chance to go get that book, check it out. Uh, again, it's about the uh, the Emmett Till case. Um, but. Um, Going back to Shreve and that idea of trying to figure out the riddle and the only people who really understand the riddle don't really know the riddle itself. Going back to what you were talking about, um, that they're not celebrating the, the old South, they're celebrating the South that has been created. Yeah, the lost cause and the, the myth of the South that was mm-hmm. created by losing the war. Yeah. I mean, and then, and then mythologizing it becomes a fairly powerful thing and Mm -hmm. and you I think it's their way of dealing with the fact they lost and somehow they're better because they did yeah and it gives them a sense of moral superiority Mm -hmm. and I I met people like that yeah when I was there I mean I I didn't meet any none of the academics or the intelligentsia were really like that you know the 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 writers and, and and philosophers in town, but there are plenty of people who've been there for a long time. whose families have been there, mm-hmm. and they reflect on a past that, if you actually know anything about the history of the South, didn't exist. Mm-hmm. You know, these these legends were passed down and changed over over decades. There's mm-hmm. no way most of this stuff happened. No, <laughs> just no. like in Faulkner, the things that they imagined happened in the past, but the Comstocks think they were mm-hmm. isn't real. Right, it's not true. Right. Well, and the other thing that's uh, fun is um, the fact that the majority of the South were not slave-owning plantation owners. They were the the poor white, uh, basic, you wouldn't even call them middle class. I mean, these are lower class people. You know, They were sharecroppers and and indentured servants. Exactly. But yet we have this... They were never paid for what they did. Yeah, exactly. So... <laughs> but yeah, all right, cool. Well, that's Faulkner. <laughs> well, it's pretty depressing, fair though, because you, we, we didn't get to the, the, the one of the reasons why they hated him so much is because of his his antics in town. Yeah, he was, a, he was a raging drunk who would do and say things you're not supposed to do in polite society, or to be honest, even in your own home. Right. Uh, a lot of these stories, we don't know if they're even true. These wonderful anecdotes. Who, who knows? But. When you hear stories about him walking up to the square drunk in his boxers and yelling at people, you hope that story is true. Or, yeah. Uh, waking up, waking up drunk, uh, and walking down to his uh, moonshine supplier and asking for more more moonshine, and his supplier comes out on the porch and says, "Sure." And then he asks Faulkner, "Is the bill? Why are you naked?" <laughs> he walked down the street without any clothes on, and he didn't know because he was so hammered. Yeah. Well, those are the stories you hear when you're there. Yeah. Well, and the the um, 
you know, the routine that he went through where he would just get smashed for two or three months and then sober up and write a novel and then get smashed again. And then, and then, of course, the the wonderful, my favorite story of Faulkner, where he's in Hollywood, he's talking to the executives, <laughs> and he looks at him and he says, "All right, well, if I'm going to write this, I need to go home." They think he's going back to his little chattel or or <laughs> or hotel or whatever. He flies back to Mississippi, <laughs> and they go to get him the next morning, and he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I think the movie he was writing was uh, To Have and Have Not, the yeah. film adaptation of uh, Hemingway's novel. Which but is ironic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Given that he hated Hemingway and Hemingway hated him. Hated him, him yeah. <laughs> Poor Faulkner. He thinks, I don't know the $10 words, but I know them all right. I choose to use more simpler words. or can't remember... Hemingway's actual Something quote. Like yeah. Basically, better language is what Hemingway is saying. He doesn't need a yeah. dictionary like Faulkner. All right, well, cool deal. Well, thank you very much, sir. We will do Happy this. Help, we will do this again next week. Um, next week, we're going to talk about students. <laughs> oh, my. You might, you might need to bleep out any expletives that come out uh, of my mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you may not actually hear anything I say except one long beep. I, don't know. <laughs> I have pretty strong opinions at this moment about students. <laughs> I'm sure, because you've been grading. Yeah. Well, ah. yeah, I got through about 30 essays today, and I'm not, I'm not a happy camper myself. So, <laughs> All right, man. Well, we will talk to you next week. Thanks again. No problem. Take care. All right, Bye-bye. you too. Bye. All right, thanks again to uh, our good buddy, Dr. J, for stopping in. Spending a little time talking about um, Mr. William Faulkner. Our Spotlight segment this week focuses on social media. Um, About a month ago, Wired ran a cover story on Facebook which detailed what happened before, during, and after the 2016 election and dove in-depth into what Zuckerberg was going to do in the aftermath. Since the company publicly accepted some, though not all, responsibility for the Russian campaign through Facebook to undermine and sway our election, the digital giant has instilled numerous new algorithms in the news feed, added more security in the form of actual human beings watching the activity on the site, and opened the door for mainstream media outlets to option subscriptions to Facebook users for legitimate news. But a byproduct of the overhauls made by Zuckerberg and his team has been the handful of former employees who either were let go or quit during and after the calamity. These few good men and women have been critical of not just Facebook and Twitter and playing the vital roles they played, but have also pointed to how social media as a whole has aided in the continued polarization of our country. Don't take this as a we need to get rid of social media because it is making us dumber and less social kind of argument. Instead, before we can get to that point of contention, we need to take a look at the actual positives that social media does afford us. I'll use Twitter as an example, specifically my feed. I follow numerous news sites and op-ed sites, both liberal and conservative. My favorites, however, are the Washington Post and New York Times, so most of the news I am exposed to has a liberal slant. Not to the degree that conservative sites would have you believe, but a slant nonetheless. The same goes for the conservative sites I follow, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Times. And though they have a conservative slant, they are not to the extreme that most of the left sites would have you believe. It's because of these slants that I follow these sources. I know, for example, that if Trump does something ignorant, the Times and the Post are going to be much harder on him than the other two. But it's through the other two sources that I can see and understand pieces of the conservative point of view and get a better, uh, more rational idea of how the story itself will play out in the overall national narrative. What makes Twitter unique and key to this is the fact that all four sources are contained within the same space, easily accessible, and readily available for debate among multiple sources from different backgrounds, regions, and nationalities. When used constructively, this presents an opportunity for us as a culture and species to grow intellectually and socially in ways that can be positive and understanding. But let's look at reality. This doesn't actually happen. What does happen is a lack of empathy followed by name-calling, trolling, insults, threats, fear, anger, hate, dark side, death star. This is how we interact with social media. We defend our turf and destroy anyone who questions our turf without regard that there may just be more than one opinion to be had. 
I am just as guilty of this as anyone else, so don't count me a saint. What scares me is how easy it is to fall down that hole, to let the anger take over the keyboard and get lost in a thread of comments that goes from debate to viral uh, to virtual barroom brawl, excuse me. Social media is not to blame for those moments. Those moments are fueled by something else, and social media has simply become the vehicle from which we travel down those dark paths. What is to blame can be traced back, I would contend, to the 1994 midterm elections where Republicans retook Congress during the Clinton administration, otherwise known as the Republican Revolution. I'm not blaming the Republicans for the deep divide that we see now, but the 1994 midterm elections were the beginning of a divide in Washington that would slowly grow over the next 20 plus years. That divide has reverberated into the populace. The Democrats are compliant with this divide, as during GW's administration, Democrats pissed, pissed away ample opportunities simply based on their detesting the president and his policies, while the Republican Congress under Obama did exactly the same thing. And now, we have a Congress that refuses to work across aisles, would rather blame each other without finding solutions, and frankly, gets absolutely nothing done. These divisions, which have reverberated through the electorate, have become the norm rather than a temporary moment, a norm that has been amplified through social media, ironically, a platform built to bring us closer, but has instead only been used to drive us apart. Note the word choice I used there, been used. While we so desperately want to blame social media for our social anxiety anxiety and awkward behaviors with other human beings, the reality is that social media does nothing but allow us to create, manipulate, and sustain our own worldview. Social media doesn't determine our worldview. It simply gives us what we want. We don't blame a toaster or microwave when it gives us exactly what we want, nor do we blame Wendy's or McDonald's for giving us french fries that we pay for. Yet, we are quick to blame social media for our own corruption. The divide in our culture can be cured rather rapidly using social media, but it is the public media, newspapers, gossip columns, reality TV, etc., that continues to promote division. For example, one of my favorite shows right now is the action comedy Lethal Weapon on Fox. It's a funny show, but the reality is that it is fiction, not because the stunts are are unreal or that situations are unbelievable, but because it promotes a good versus evil black and white idea of the world. This is not an accurate representation of our actual world. Our world is not black or white. Our world is multicolored with numerous options and opinions. Believe it or not, social media can be made to represent those multiple colors, multiple options. We choose not to use it that way, however. Which brings me to my point. We don't need to rethink social media. We need to rethink how we use social media. Zuckerberg can create a million and one algorithms that specialize your news feed, but if you are only reading those stories that interest you, then you are continuing to perpetuate your worldview. Facebook is simply giving you what you want. If we want real change and we want to see the divide shrink, then we need to change what we see, not what social media shows us. Finally, this week we lost two... um, two markers of our our culture one of them being Stephen Hawking he passed away Wednesday night I think the big takeaway from his life is the fact that a disease that was supposed to take his life in just a couple of years became nothing more than a speed bump for a brain that explored universes that none of us have ever seen may you rest in peace the other death is that of Toys R Us yes I'm actually talking about the death of a toy store chain but those of you who are like me part of the X generation and you older millennials, you'll remember those wonderful first times or wonderful times when you walked into Toys R Us, especially around Christmas time, and you could smell the new toys. When you walked into Toys R Us, there was a feeling. That feeling is now going to be gone forever. Social media has something to do with that as well, but I choose not to go down that road because there's all kinds of arguments that could that are for and against children being on social media. So, that's it for this week's show. Next week, we'll have another fun look at the headlines. Dr. J will join me in discussing smartphones in the classroom and a lot more. For Dr. J, I am the barber. Thank you for coming by. Make it a great day. And always remember, as long as the sun rises, there is opportunity. This has been the Beta Files.